So yes, I'm Robin Farman Farmian. I have actually mispronounced my own name on stage. So anyone, you do not have to remember my last name. <laughs> so give you a little background on me. I'm a serial entrepreneur, worked on about 12 or, or, or 13 or so early stage startup companies, all in cutting edge medical technology and biotechnology. Now, the reason I decided to become an entrepreneur and working on companies that will impact at least millions, if not billions of people in medicine, because as a teenager, I was misdiagnosed with an autoimmune disease. Ended up resulting in 43 hospitalizations and six major surgeries. Now, when you're facing surgery, right, and especially when you're a kid, right, you go from hospital system to hospital system looking for the very best doctors out there. But none of my doctors ever looked at me and said, you know what, Robin, let's hold off on these surgeries because you're so young and technology is moving so quickly. Let's hold off just to see what kind of innovation is happening in the next few years. Nobody ever looked at me and said, you know what, Robin? Technology is hope. But technology is hope. In fact, had digital health IT and the sheer amount of information we now have access to as patients existed when I was a teenager, I most likely would not have lost three organs. The age of 26, this is seven years after they'd taken out my entire large intestine, my doctors were telling me I was cured, but I wasn't. I was in extreme pain. So instead of dealing with what was potentially the, the source of that, my doctors put me on long-term prednisone. In fact, they wanted me to be on it for the rest of my life, and 80 milligrams a day of methadone, oh. right? I became essentially a shut-in. I was way too sick to even you know, go to the grocery store, let alone hold down a job. I went into my doctor's office, and I'm like, can, can you guys help me, please? I'm like, well, next thing what we can do is install, uh, surgically implant a morphine pump into your spine. I was 26 years old, right? And they were talking about me being on very high-dose opiates for the rest of my life. I was like, Shh, no way. Went home that night fired my entire healthcare team, every single one of my doctors, found new ones, doctors that thought outside the box, right, healthcare professionals that worked with me as a colleague and a peer and allowed me to be the main decision maker, right? Ended up getting diagnosed correctly, right? put on a drug called Remicade, right? And after the very first infusion, it's, a, it's an IV, I went into remission overnight after a 13-year battle with a misdiagnosis and all of those surgeries, suddenly I turned back into that girl that you saw on the dance floor last night. <laughs> Woo -hoo! So that's why I'm up here to talk to you today, how the convergence of a lot of these different exponential technologies will enable patients to take control the way I did, right? Not only that, but it's dramatically changing the way we are looking at medicine. When I'm talking about exponential technology, I'm talking about things like robotics, artificial intelligence, sensors, 3D printing, networks and computer systems in order to use things like the power of the crowd. So I want to give you a good foundation on what linear versus exponential actually means, right? Linear is one, two, three, four, five. Exponential, of course, is a doubling. Two, four, six, eight, right? So when you're talking about linear, you're talking about, you know, essentially, if you sort of take 30 linear steps, right? One, two, three, four, five. I can pretty much visualize where I'm going to end up, maybe right around the, the video cameras right there, right? If I were to take 30 exponential steps, I end up actually circumnavigating the globe 26 times, right? Crazy difference. 30 linear steps, 30 meters, right? 30 exponential steps, almost 1 billion meters, right? Massive difference to give you an idea of how fast these technologies are actually moving. Which brings me to something called the law of accelerating returns. This was invented by my mentor, Ray Kurzweil. And it is the fact that more advanced societies have the ability to progress at a faster rate than less advanced societies. I'll give you a hardcore, concrete example of that. If you were to take, say, someone from the year 1750 and drop them into present day, they would literally die of shock from the sheer amount of changes in that 250-year period. But you couldn't go back to 1500 and drop someone into 1750 and expect that same rate of change, right? They'd be a little confused, 
but they would get used to it and they would not die of shock. In order to have that same shock value, you actually have to go back to 12,000 BC, right? And for that person at 12,000 BC to have that same shock value that you had in that 250-year period from 1750 to now, you would have to go to back to 100,000 BC. So let me repeat this. More advanced societies, us, have the ability to progress at a faster rate than less advanced societies. Now, first of all, I want to just point out that this century, we are expecting to see 1,000 times the amount of progress that we saw in the last century. Remember that century that brought us things like cell phones, planes, internet, <laughs> right? 1,000 times, if you can even wrap your brain around that particular number. How many people here have been to Abundance 360? Raise your hands. A couple, okay, so you have probably seen the six Ds of exponential technology. And this, again, is to give you a foundation so you understand just how fast these technologies are moving. So once a technology gets digitized, meaning a series of ones and zeros, turns into an information-based technology and has the ability to hop on that exponential curve. Now, if you think about it, we are not only digitizing our entire bodies, you know, things like genetics and with all the sensors, but we are digitizing everything in our world, right? Relationships, memories, and all of our information are becoming a series of ones and zeros. Exponential technology is deceptive. In those early stages, when you were talking about tiny little incremental changes, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.04, 0 0.08, these are tiny little changes. In fact, it doesn't even seem to be moving as quickly as a linear technology. But it hits that inflection point, and bam, it goes vertical when you're talking about doubling in the millions or the billions. Now, to give you a concrete example of that, I want to raise the hands in the room. How many people think 3D printing is a one to 10 year old technology? Okay, how many people think it's B, 11 to 20? Okay, how about C, 21 to 30? Okay, I think it's about 50-50 between those two. Well, it is a 25 to 30 year old technology, right? But it has recently hit its inflection point. In fact, all of us in this room are right now living through an industrial revolution. Exponential technology, of course, is disruptive. It can take down entire industries in what seems like a matter of months. Uber being a prime example of this, catalyzed by platform technologies, right? Utilizing computing networks, and of course, the power of the crowd. This is a fundamental game-changing shift, right? Another example of disruption is what we call the Kodak moment. 1996, Kodak was a $38 billion company, 140,000 employees. Right? 2010, Instagram is born. 2012, Kodak declares bankruptcy. Two months later, Instagram is acquired for $1 billion valuation with only 13 employees. Now, the reason this happened is because Kodak did not understand what business they were in. In fact, in 1975, this is Steve Sasson. He invented the digital camera, and he was working for Kodak at the time. He went to management and said, look what I did. Isn't this amazing? Management said, no, absolutely not. We are not going to develop that. We are in the paper, chemicals, and film industry. And if we develop that, people are not going to buy you know, and print out photos anymore. We don't want to disrupt our own revenue stream. Well, we all know what happened, right? I think that they, frankly, should have thought of themselves as being in the industry of preserving memories and all the different ways you can do that. Raise your hands. How many people have heard of Under Armour? OK, about half the room. What this is is a clothing company with sensor technology made for athletes. Well, they do not think of themselves as a clothing company or as a hardware company. They think of themselves first and foremost as a community company and a data company. They have plugged into IBM Watson's open API, and they are doing predictive analytics for their customer base. In fact, they have acquired or built the world's largest food entry database, right? And they've got a digital health platform with 700 million users. 
Exponential technology demonetizes and dematerializes things. I like to talk about these in things in conjunction with each other because they're very similar, right? To demonetize is to pull the money out of something. To dematerialize is to no longer need it to exist as a separate unit, right? All of us in this room right now are carrying around one million dollars worth of 1980s and 1990s technologies in our smartphones, right? And Instagram's free editing software. That was a two million dollar software package just 10 years ago. So, what in your personal or professional lives, right, is too expensive for you right now that all of a sudden tomorrow it's going to be free? And lastly, exponential technology democratizes things, makes it available to a large number of people. An African farmer today has more power, computing power, in the palm of his hand than Clinton did during his presidency. All right, so let's talk about what it's like to be a patient today and in the near future. Well, we have a lot of point-of-care diagnostic devices. What that means is a diagnostic device comes to the patient versus the patient having to go to the you know, traditional setting in the hospital or the clinic right, to get diagnosed. Take, for example, the AliveCore EKG monitor. What this is is an FDA-approved, essentially goes on your iPhone case or on your Apple Watch, Clinical-grade data, under $100 to buy this, right? So now I can take my EKG with my iPhone case, send the data up to the cloud, where it's going to be analyzed by artificial intelligence. And if there's a problem, my physician is going to be alerted. And telepresent medicine right now is on a massive upswing. In fact, I can see my physician via FaceTime, Skype, or even potentially telepresent robot. What about potentially getting my medication delivered by drone? Yep, drone technology, of course, is on an upswing as well. There's a company called Zipline, $19 million of funding out of California, partnered in part with UPS, and they've gone into Rwanda, and they're expecting to launch in July. Now, what they are doing is the first fully national system of drone delivery for healthcare and medicine. Right? And they're able to do it in, in a country like Rwanda because they don't have these antiquated laws that we have for air traffic control, right? I mean, we have so much to worry about in the EU and the United States. Rwanda doesn't have that. So they can implement these things very, very quickly. One of the few countries that I'm going to watch very closely to see how this works. We're starting to see drones being utilized in other areas of medicine. This is a company out of the EU. They're doing essentially flying defibrillators. If they are able to achieve this, they can reach a heart attack victim in under 60 seconds, and they will increase survival rates from 8% to 80%. And flying cars, they now exist. This launched at CES this year. The one-person ambulance drone carries 260 pounds and can fly for 23 minutes. They are in early conversations with a company called Lung Biotechnology, who's working on tissue engineering for transplant organs. They are going to be doing 1,000 of these drones for that company, um, so that they are able to deliver organs very, very quickly. All right, so we are entering a perfect storm right now of technological advancements really enabling what I like to call the era of the patient. So everything from the medical science and genetic sequencing, not only is this on the exponential trend, but it is outperforming Moore's law, right? 2001, it cost $2.7 billion to get to that first genome. Sequencing the genome itself, about $100 million. Today, well, we just hit the $995 mark. This is the inflection point. This is the number experts the world over agreed is the inflection point in genetic sequencing. Right? Over the next five to 10 years, we are going to have the dollar, if not the penny genome, and we were going to be able to sequence the world. Talk about a massive amount of resulting big data, predictive analytics, early onset diagnostics, and even hopefully a leap towards stage zero medicine. And a raise of hands in the room. How many people have heard of the microbiome? OK, about, about half or a third. So the microbiome is the colonies of bacteria that live in and on our bodies. Symbiotic relationship, we need them, they need us, right? It's about a one-to-one -one ratio, meaning only 50% of our bodies are actually human. And we have not been taking this into account when we treat medicine, right? Think about some things that, um, some theories, right? I have Crohn's disease, so maybe when I'm feeling my best, I bank my microbiome, right? Just like you bank umbilical cord blood, 
and then I get a transplant back when I'm not feeling well. Or, this one blows my mind even when I say it every time, imagine some of these diseases that we thought were genetic, in fact, turn out to be infectious through the microbiome. And sequencing technology is catalyzing this, real-life Jurassic Park. This is not the future, this is today. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the software aspects. Artificial intelligence, of course, is the big buzzword now. Now, artificial intelligence is actually not a new technology. It is a very old technology. It is a future technology, and it is a right-now technology. In fact, all of us in this room have been using AI seamlessly for years, and we don't even realize it. The phrase was coined back in 1956, and many experts have complained over the years that once AI works, no one actually calls it AI anymore. Now, IBM Watson is one of the companies really leading the way in AI applied to healthcare. Look at those stats of what it's able to digest. That was just the first year it went to medical school. What human being can do that, right? And if you think about the fact that there are over 10,000 known human diseases, how is a physician supposed to keep up, right? They can't. But when they have AI helping them, absolutely they can. Now, this is really interesting. IBM's error rate in 1995 for recognizing conversational human speech was 43%. That has dropped last year to 8%, right? So this year, we're at 6.9%. How many, like, uh, somebody shout out, what do you think the human error rate of understanding conversational English for a native English speaker is? Anyone? 25? <laughs> Someone say that? <laughs> it's actually, it's 4%. When do you think AI is going to meet and exceed that? Remember, this is not a linear technology. This is an exponential technology. End of the year? Next year at the latest? And IBM Watson has opened up their API for anyone to use. Whether you're a Fortune 500 company, entrepreneur, physician, patient, you have access to utilizing Watson, right? One of the most powerful supercomputers in the world. Why would they do that? Well, AI improves more quickly the more it's used. When you are talking about things like deep learning on neural networks, which is a part of AI, you literally need trillions of data points, trillions. And of course, it does give them a nice revenue stream. <laughs> <laughs> So we're seeing, um, actually, IBM Watson outperform therapists and psychiatrists already in the mental health space. So these companies are really interesting talk space. In fact, a couple of months ago, I had a broken heart. <laughs> it was a small one. But I was like, oh my god, opportunity! I want to see what talk space does and, and learn all about it. So talk space is you do all your visits by text with your therapist. But the really cool thing is, is they plugged into Watson's open personality API and they match a physician or a therapist to you based on your personality, which is a really big deal because if you're going in to see a psychiatrist or a therapist and you don't mesh well with their personality the first time out, you may never go back. And that means you may never receive the health care that you need, right? But Talkspace helps with that by matching you the first time out. Think about Match.com, but for therapy. And what's really cool, it's like $99 a month for unlimited texting with your therapist, right? That is a very disruptive business model. <laughs> so uh, Ellie, Ellie is really cool. So this is a decision diagnostic support software. They, Ellie is outperforming therapists with PTSD and depression. Now, for a couple of reasons. Not only does it, Ellie, analyze things like, you know, responses to queries, just like you would as a therapist, but it analyzes your tone of voice, facial expression, and even the subtle way you string words together over a period of time, whether that's days, weeks, or months, right? You can't do that as a therapist. And it turns out, when somebody's going into therapy, you know, the therapist is not supposed to be judgmental, not supposed to give any facial expression when you tell them about things, but of course they're human and they may accidentally do it. But, you know, as a patient, even if the therapist is not judgmental, the fact that you're in front of another human being makes you feel judged, and you're going to close down. Therapy is not going to be as advantageous as it possibly could be, right? But turns out, when you are in front of an AI, you can open up much more because patients don't actually feel judged. And IBM Watson did a study on psychosis. So it turns out about 1% of everyone between the ages of 14 and 27 are at risk for developing a psychosis sometime later on in life. 
Well, Watson did a study and with, was able to predict with 100% accuracy. What? 100% accuracy? Those people that actually did go on to develop a psychosis. Right? That's the app I want running in the back of my phone. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> We're starting to see emotional robots hit the scene as well. The little cat on the, uh, on the side, I have that one. It's the $99 Hasbro toy cat, AI-enabled. It's specifically for elder care. It's, in, it's infancy, right? But the one, the pepper robot, this one is amazing. So it came out of Japan last year, and in prototype form, they had about 1,000 units, sold for $1,600, sold out in under 60 seconds. Wow, right? They have now distributed about 10,000 of these units throughout Asia and Europe, and they're hoping to hit the United States this year. All right, we talked about medical science and software. Let's talk about hardware, and of course, this is a really big area of medicine. So sensors, of course, you've heard of the phrase, the Internet of Things, coined back in 2009. Well, I'm thinking about an Internet of You. Remember, we are experiencing a paradigm shift right now. Everything, everything is going Digital. In fact, by 2019, it is expected that the digital and fingerprint analysis market is going to be a $50 billion a year industry. That is three times the size of the global music industry. I won't talk about wearable tech because we all know about that, but this is biometric smartware. It's gone mainstream. OM compression shirts, they, what they do is they do your EKG by using compression around your rib cage. They've partnered with Polo Ralph Lauren. Right? And Intel, of course, has its own version of a smart shirt. Now, that is not something I ever thought I would see in my lifetime. Polo Ralph Lauren and Intel, head-to-head -head competitors in the clothing market. Right? And companies like Sensoria and Healthwatch are getting into the clinical space. Healthwatch has a 15-lead EKG monitoring shirt specifically for patients. And Sensoria, while they have a lot of consumer-facing stuff, they are working on things like socks that measure gait for neurodegenerative diseases. Now, I love the quantified self movement. In fact, I've been in it since 2008, 2009, since it was a grassroots movement. But I'm not wearing a QS device today. Why? Well, first of all, my battery died, right? And can't find it. But the big deal is, is that the majority of them will not go with this outfit, which is a huge consideration when you are talking about patient engagement and compliance. Because if a patient doesn't like the way something looks or feels, they're not going to use it. But technology makes things seamless. The way I see this going is not just epidermal electronics. When I'm talking about that, I'm talking about temporary tattoos that sit on your skin for about two weeks at a time. One of the big companies working on this right now is MC10. They have partnered with L'Oreal Cosmetics, of all companies. L'Oreal has been putting literally millions of dollars a year into R&D, strangely enough, in the medical space. This is one of the areas. They already have a sensor that measures UV radiation. But the way I see this going is subcutaneous, which means right under the skin. Right? This is a company called New Deal Design, the original designers behind the Fitbit. And they are working on subcutaneous tattoos. Not only will they glow when they need to tell you something, but it'll be able to even record who you've seen that day and potentially open up smart locks. And verily, verily is Google's life sciences division. They have partnered with Novartis, and they are working on contact lenses that do continuous monitoring of glucose. Not just for diabetics. I'm not diabetic, but I would love to know my glucose on a daily basis or an hourly basis, and I can start to monitor and do my eating around that, right? And Sens uh, Sensomed has just recently got FDA approval. It's uh, contact lenses that measure glaucoma progression. And this is really exciting. So Freestyle Libra launched in the EU in October with its CE mark, not yet in uh, the United States. But they are doing continuous monitoring of glucose with, with a patch. You keep the patch on for about two weeks at a time. It's got a little tiny filament that sits under the skin, and it monitors your glucose every minute, right? Game changer in diabetes. And this is a whole new category called ingestibles. This particular project is out of MIT. It's a vital sign pill. So imagine, on a daily basis, you pop your vitamin and you pop your vital sign pill. Imagine the amount of data that we are going to be able to get. Not only will it be clinical grade, but we'll be able to do it like it's outside the physician's office. And when you go into a physician's office, you get your pulse or your blood pressure. They not, they're not always the normal levels because you're outside of your normal environment. So we'll be able to get a lot more accurate data this way. 
and Proteus. So Proteus is really cool. See it, the tiny size of it? It's at the end of that push pin, about this big. Right. FDA approved already. So what it does is it's made of silicone, magnesium, and copper. What happens when it hits the gastric juices of a patient's stomach creates a chemical reaction enough of a chemical reaction to cause an, an, to be an energy source, to transmit a signal to a Bluetooth-enabled patch you're wearing somewhere on your body, which then syncs to your app on your iPhone. Now, this is a really big deal for people with dementia, Alzheimer's, bipolar, schizophrenia, things, uh, diseases or, or disorders where you either forget if you've taken your medication, or in some cases you really don't want to, and you need the feedback loops of somebody watching you. And this is a really exciting project. So this has nothing to do with healthcare, but I can see the implications far and wide, right? Disney and Carnegie Mellon teamed up, and they are doing something called EM Sense. Turns out every single metal object in our environment emits an electromagnetic noise, right? And so this prototype watch is able to pick that up and then interact with it. Let me give you some examples. Say I jump on my motorcycle. I could have a motorcycle. <laughs> well, okay, maybe I don't. But pretend I jump on my motorcycle. Not only will my watch be able to identify that it is, in fact, a motorcycle, but it is, in fact, my motorcycle. It'll launch my calendar app, and it'll launch something like my Waze app that uses the power of the crowd to determine traffic patterns. And it will tell me that in existing traffic, I am 12 minutes from my destination on a motorcycle. Right? I can program it so when I touch my office doorknob, it launches a reminder app that says, Robin, don't forget to pick up milk on your way home, right? So automatically interacts with metal objects in your environment, unlocks your computer, unlocks your car, right? Imagine the implications in medicine. All right, so let's talk a little bit about 3D printing. And as I mentioned, we are right now in the middle of an industrial revolution. 3D printing is one of the most disruptive technologies out there across every single industry and economy. Right now, we can do 360,000 different colors in one print job. In fact, that sneaker was done in one print job. And we have been 3D printing sneakers for years. In fact, Nike has been doing it for years, and they just didn't market it. It was just an easier way to manufacture, right? And we can now print in 300 different materials. In fact, recently, we ground up uh, an asteroid and used that as the ink. How cool is that, right? <laughs> So the main concept behind 3D printing is complexity is free. Let me repeat that. Complexity is free, meaning costs the exact same amount of money to 3D print something that fits my body perfectly as it does for anybody else in the audience. Some great examples of that, the, the skull and the rib cage, those are made of titanium, right? 3D printed titanium, perfectly fitted for that patient. The little girl with the robot arm, so that is a company called Enable, has 8,000 volunteers and helps bring robotic arms, 3D printed, essentially, to people in the developing world that don't have access or can't afford it otherwise. It literally costs dollars to make. And the physician holding up that 3D printed heart, what that is is a plastic version of a patient he's about ready to go and have surgery, right? And so you you have an exact replica. Not only can the surgeon figure out you know, exactly where he needs to operate, but he has it in order to refer to it when he's actually inside of the body. <laughs> Some other examples. How many people have had a cast in their life? Raise your hands. All right. Do you remember how uncomfortable it was? It was hot, you it was itchy, it smelled, you couldn't get it wet. Well, we can now 3D print casts, not only with holes in them for scratching, but are completely waterproof, right? What a game changer for treatment plans. We can do things like scoliosis back braces, tracheas, and let me point to you that one in the middle. That's a wheelchair for a dog. <laughs> Pretty odd thing for me to show you, right? What's the concept behind it? So the owner needed a, a, a wheelchair, so what he did instead of trying to buy one, he created the CAD design files himself, right? 3D printed it out, set the design files up to the cloud, and made it free for anybody in the world to use. So now if you want a wheelchair for your dog, you can download these, scale them, right, and 3D print them out. Different ways of doing that, you can go to companies like Shapeways, just send the files over the internet. Shapeways will print it out in one of many, many different materials. You have your choice. They mail it to you literally for dollars, and then you put it together, and you've suddenly got a 3D printed wheelchair. 
And Mattel this year is expecting to launch a $300 3D printer specifically for children. So basically, yeah, you just go into your kid's bedroom, which all of them are going to have 3D printers in the next five years, and just print things out. Now, this is Amy Mullins. She lost her legs very, very young age. She does not think of herself as disabled. In fact, she has 12 sets of legs. If she wants to be six feet tall, she is. If she wants to be five, six, she is, right? <laughs> and because she, she uses this as an opportunity with things like 3D printing and all the advances of technology, you are not constrained to the physical form of the normal human body. Why would I get a leg? If I needed new legs, why would I have them that would function just like the ones we have? Like if I wanted a wrist, why wouldn't I have it go 360 degrees around, right? Why not? So she actually has a pair of legs that allow her to run faster than any single person in this audience. Do you call that disabled? Right. And this is a physician in Gaza, so of course a very difficult area of the world to get medical supplies in. He needed a stethoscope and couldn't get one. So he created the CAD design files himself, right? 3D printed it for under $5. The most ubiquitous object in medicine just got disrupted. He says the data behind it is as accurate as the $200 models that you find in the US. And biological 3D printing, oh, this is such an exciting area. I'm working tangentially with it with the nonprofit I co-founded called the Oregon Preservation Alliance. Now, let me tell you where this technology is, and we're talking essentially 3D printing vascular organs. Vascular organs, the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the liver, right? Well, we can now do tiny little printed sections of liver and kidneys to test for drug toxicity. This is a big deal in things like clinical trials. When you think about the fact that it costs about 10 to 12 billion dollars to get one oncology drug to market, right? For a neural drug, up to 15 billion dollars to get one to market. Anything that we can do to streamline that approval process or just the, the, the R&D behind it, absolutely game changing. But companies like Lung Biotechnology, I mentioned earlier, what they're doing is taking ghost organs. What that means is they take a, like a pig organ or a human organ, decellularize it, meaning wash away all the cells, but leave the scaffolding in place and the vascular system in place. Repopulate it with the patient recipient's stem cells, and all of a sudden you have a new organ. Right? That's probably 10 to 12 years from market. To do one from scratch, where you're just literally tissue engineering without the ghost organ, 15 to 25 years are, the, are the, uh, the numbers that I've heard from the different tissue engineers. But again, this is an exponential technology, so it may be faster than you think. And like I'm envisioning a world where instead of taking a medication or having surgery, like minor surgery or something, why not just switch out your organ? Right? That's going to definitely help with things like life extension. All right, I want to talk to you very quickly about robotics and brain-computer interfaces, BCIs, also called BMIs, brain-machine interfaces, because it's about the convergence. Now, if I was to give you like, a really nice overview of robotics, it's another hour-long presentation. So I'm going to go through a couple of things quickly, but I want to use this as an example. Remember, it's not any one individual technology. It is the convergence of all of these technologies. So what we can do already, this is uh, University of Washington, one of the places I watch for a lot of uh, the technological advancements. This happened a few years ago. Right? Two scientists, two separate brain-computer interfaces in two separate buildings, right? They separated, and one scientist was able to move the other scientist's finger with his thoughts. This exists. This already exists. And here we are with the Luke robotic arm. He is controlling that robotic arm with his brain. Wow, right? This is FDA approved. It's on the market, right? You can, uh, you can potentially get your hands on one of these, pun intended. And we are starting to see robotics in augmented mobility. This is my friend Amanda. She was paralyzed from the waist down in a skiing accident about 20 years ago. And she is now walking. Right? This is an exoskeleton. Technology originally developed out of the Department of Defense in the United States for military men to be able to walk farther and, and carry you know, hundreds of pounds more. But of course, the applications in medicine are huge. Not only can paralyzed people walk using an exoskeleton, but uh, countries like Japan, with an aging workforce, are actually issuing 
exoskeletons to some of the people that are working in, say, the factories that are over the age of 65, just to augment them, right? And social robots. Now, I talked a little bit about emotional robots. These two particular robots are in Japan and in parts of Asia, and they're getting really realistic looking. But the reason I'm showing you this in conjunction with brain-computer interfaces is because I'm estimating in about five years, a lot of us are going to have robots in the home, and within about 10 years, we're going to be controlling them, robots like this, with our brains. Wow. Right? Mind-blowing. All right, and let's talk just a little bit about infrastructure. So just like with banking and education, infrastructure and content are separating. You are no longer constrained to a physical venue just to receive healthcare. In fact, you are not constrained to a physical venue to do just about anything. Your job, education, romantic life, right? Social life, everything is going digital. And what is starting to catalyze this, of course, are uh, being able to get online. It's expected an additional three billion people will be going online over the next few years. Talk about massive markets opening up, right? What's catalyzing that is literally billions of dollars going into making sure that happens. Things like internet.org, this is Mark Zuckerberg's brainchild. He has partnered with companies like Qualcomm and Nokia to be able to not only re reduce the cost by 100x of in existing infrastructure, but being able to bring more infrastructure utilizing drones. OneWeb has par uh, partnered with Virgin Galactic. They have a half a billion dollars worth of funding, and they want to do it with 600 satellites in the air. Direct competitor to Elon Musk, billion dollars of funding, and he wants to do it with 400 satellites in the air. And X, which is Google's uh, moonshot division, they are doing it with hot air balloons that will circumnavigate the globe in the air currents. Right? And all of this technology is really raising the bar on the interaction between the patient and the physician. So if you think back to the title of my talk, the patient as the CEO of the healthcare team, and just like the CEO of a corporation, I mean, think about it, you aren't an expert in engineering, marketing, sales, infrastructure, organizational management, right, as the CEO. You are not expert in those things. What you are is an expert in a global view of the company, right, and understanding the place of the company. So what you do as CEO of a company is you hire experts, best vice presidents, support staff, advisors, board members. They do their job, report back to you, and together, as a team, you decide on a direction for the company to go into. But as CEO, you are the one who is ultimately responsible that that vision is carried out, and the company overall is successful. Why should being a patient be any different? And all of this, of course, is causing a massive paradigm shift in the power dynamic between patients and physicians. What are, how are physicians going to react? Well, you know, it could be a lot more mutual respect and will definitely improve outcomes because, of course, patients are a lot more engaged. But there could be some pitfalls because patients could come in thinking they know more than they do, right? Or worse, misdiagnose at home and never see a doctor. So I want to leave you with this thought. Everybody in this room, right now, you are now the CEO of your own healthcare team, right? How does that means you are going to start to change your behavior today. So just like I did over a decade ago when I stopped allowing medicine to disrupt my life and I became the disruptor, imagine a world where more patients are doing that. To me, the future of the patient is the future of medicine. Thank you.